Chapter three point twenty nine, part two of Personal Narrative of Travels to the Equinoctial Regions of America during the years seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o four, volume three, by Alexander von Humboldt, translated by Thomasina Ross. The Slipper Rocks recording is in the public domain. Chapter three point twenty nine, part two. The island of Cuba, over more than four fifths of its surface, is composed of low lands. The soil is covered with secondary and tertiary formations, formed by some rocks of gneiss granite, cyanite, and euphotide. The knowledge obtained hitherto of the geologic configuration of the country is as unsatisfactory as what is known respecting the relative age and nature of the soil. It is only ascertained that the highest group of mountains lies at the southeastern extremity of the island, between Cape Cruz, Punta Macy, and Holquin. This mountain is part called the Sierra or Los Montanas de Cobra, the Copper Mountains, situated northwest of the town of Santiago de Cuba, appears to be about twelve hundred toises in height. If this calculation be correct, the summits of the Sierra would command those of the Blue Mountains of Jamaica, and the peaks of La Selle and La Hotte in the island of San Domingo. The Sierra of Tarquino, fifty miles west of the town of Cuba, belongs to the same group as the Copper Mountains. The island is crossed from east-southeast to west-northwest by a chain of hills, which approach the southern coast between the meridians of La Cuidad de Puerto Principe and the Via Clara, while, further to the westward, toward Alvarez and Matanzas, they stretch in the direction of the northern coast. Proceeding from the mouth of the Rio Guaurabo to the Via de la Trinidad, I saw on the northwest the Lomas de San Juan, which form needles, or horns, more than three hundred toises high with their declivities sloping regularly to the south. This calcareous group presents a majestic aspect, as seen from the anchorage near the Cayo de Piedras. Huagua and Batabano are low coasts, and I believe that, in general, west of the meridian of Matanzas, there is no hill more than two hundred toises high, with the exception of the Pan de Guayabon. The land in the interior of the island is gently undulated, as in England, and it rises only from forty-five to fifty toises above the level of the sea. The objects most visible at a distance, and most celebrated by navigators, are the Pan de Montanzas, a truncated cone which has the form of a small monument, the Arcos de Canasi, which appear between Puerto Escondido and Huaruco, like small segments of a circle, the Mesa de Mariel, the Tetas de Managua, and the Pan de Guayabon. This gradual slope of the limestone formations of the island of Cuba towards the north and west indicates the submarine connection of those rocks with the equally low lands of the Bahama Islands, Florida, and Yucatan. Intellectual cultivation and improvement were so long restricted to the Havana and the neighboring districts that we cannot be surprised at the ignorance prevailing among the inhabitants respecting the geological formation of the Copper Mountains. Don Francisco Ramirez, a traveller versed in chemical and mineralogical science, informed me that the western part of the island is granitic, and that he there observed gneiss and primitive slate. Probably the alluvial deposits of auriferous sand, which were explored with much ardour at the beginning of the conquest, to the great misfortune of the natives, came from those granitic formations. Note. At Cubanacan, that is, in the interior of the island, near Hagua and Trinidad, where the auriferous sands have been washed by the waters as far as the limestone soil. Martyr Tanguira, the most intelligent writer on the conquest, says, quote, Cuba is richer in gold than Hispaniola, San Domingo, and at the moment I am writing, 180,000 Castellanos of ore have been collected at Cuba. End quote. Herrera estimates the tax called King's Fifth, Quinto del Rey, in the island of Cuba at 6,000 pesos, which indicates an annual product of 2,000 marks of gold at 22 carats, and consequently purer than the gold of Sabao in San Domingo. In 1804, the mines of Mexico altogether produced 7,000 marks of gold, and those of Peru 3,400. It is difficult in these calculations to distinguish between the gold sent to Spain by the first conquistadors, that obtained by washings, and that which had been accumulated for ages in the hand of the natives, who were pillaged at will. Supposing that in the two islands of Cuba and San Domingo, in Cubanacan and Tibau, the product of the washings was 3,000 marks of gold, 
we find a quantity three times less than the gold furnished annually, 1790 to 1805, by the small province of Choco. In this supposition of ancient wealth, there is nothing improbable, and if we are surprised at the scanty produce of the gold washings attempted in our days at Cuba and San Domingo, which were hitherto four prolific, it must be recollected that at Brazil also the product of the gold washings has fallen from 1760 to 1820 from 6,600 gold kilograms to less than 595. Lumps of gold weighing several pounds found in our days in Florida and North and South Carolina prove the primitive wealth of the whole basin of the Antilles from the island of Cuba to the Appalachian chain. It is also natural that the product of the gold washings should diminish with greater rapidity than that of the subterraneous working of the veins. The metals not being renewed in the clefts of the veins, by sublimation, now accumulate in alluvial soil by the course of the rivers where tablelands are higher than the level of the surrounding running waters. But in rocks with metalliferous veins, the miner does not at once know all he has to work. He may chance to lengthen the labors, to go deep, and to cross other accompanying veins. Alluvial soils are generally of small depth, where they are auriferous. They most frequently rest upon sterile rocks. Their superficial position and uniformity of composition help to the knowledge of their limits, and wherever workmen can be collected, and where the waters for the washings abound, accelerate the total working of the auriferous clay. These considerations, suggested by the history of the conquest, and by the science of mining, may throw some light on the problem of the metallic wealth of haiti in that island as well as at brazil it would be more profitable to attempt subterraneous workings on veins in primitive and intermediary soils than to renew the gold washings which were abandoned in the ages of barbarism rapine and carnage End of note. traces of that sand are still found in the rivers hawkwin and Yescambray, known in general in the vicinity of via clara santo espiritu Puerto del Principe de Bayamo and the Bahia de Nipa. The abundance of copper mentioned by the conquistadors of the sixteenth century, at a period when the Spaniards were more attentive than they have been in latter times to the natural productions of America, may possibly be attributed to the formations of amphibolic slate, transition clay slate mixed with diorite, and to euphotides analogous to those I found in the mountains of Guanabacoa. The central and western parts of the island contain two formations of compact limestone, one of clayey sandstone and another of gypsum. The former has, in its aspect and composition, some resemblance to the Jura formation. It is white, or of a clear ochre yellow, with a dull fracture sometimes conchoidal, sometimes smooth, divided into thin layers, furnishing some balls of pyromax silex, often hollow, at Rio Canimar, two leagues east of Matanzas, and petrifactions of pectin, cardites, terebratules and madrepores note i saw neither griffites nor ammonites of jura limestone nor the nummulites or cerites of coarse limestone End of note i found no oolitic beds but porous beds almost bulbous between the potrero del conde de mopax and the port of batabano resembling the spongy beds of jura limestone in franconia near dondorf pegnitz and tumbach yellowish cavernous strata with cavities from three to four inches in diameter, alternate with strata altogether compact, and poorer in petrifactions. Note. The western part of the island has no deep ravines, and we recognize this alternation in travelling from the Havana to Batabano. The deepest beds, inclined from thirty to forty degrees northeast, appear as we advance. End of note. The chain of hills that borders the plain of Guinness on the north, and is linked with the Lomas de Camua, and the tetas de managua belongs to the latter variety which is reddish white and almost of lithographic nature like the jura limestone of pappenheim the compact and cavernous beds contain nests of brown ochraceous iron possibly the red earth tierra colorado so much sought for by the coffee planters haciendados owes its origin to the decomposition of some superficial beds of oxidated iron mixed with silex and clay or to a reddish sandstone, note, sandstone and ferruginous sand, iron sand, end of note, superposed on limestone. The whole of this formation, which I shall designate by the name of limestone of Guinness, to distinguish it from another more recent, forms, near Trinidad, 
in the lomas of san juan steep declivities resembling the mountains of limestone in caripe in the vicinity of cumana they also contain great caverns near matanzas and Haruco, where i have not heard that any fossil bones have been found the frequency of caverns in which the pluvial rivers accumulate and where small rivers disappear sometimes causes a sinking of the earth i am of opinion that the gypsum of the island of cuba belongs not to tertiary but to secondary soil it is worked in several places on the east of matanzas at san antonio de los banos where it contains sulphur and at the chaos opposite san juan de los remedios we must not confound with this limestone of guinas sometimes porous sometimes compact another formation so recent that it seems to augment in our days i allude to the calcareous agglomerates which i saw in the islands of chaos that border the coast between batabano and the bay of jagua principally south of the cieniga de zapata Cayo buenito Cayo flamenco and Cayo de piedras the soundings prove that they are rocks rising abruptly from a bottom of between twenty and thirty fathoms some are at the water's edge others one-fourth or one-fifth of a toise above the surface of the sea angular fragments of madrepores and cellularia from two to three cubic inches are found cemented by grains of quartzo sand the inequalities of the rocks are covered by mould in which by help of a microscope we only distinguish the detritus of shells and corals this tertiary formation no doubt belongs to that of the coast of cumana cartagena and the great land of guadalupe noticed in my geognostic table of south america note m moreau de jean has well distinguished in his histoire physique des antilles françoises between the roche à of martinique and haiti which is porous filled with terebratulites and other vestiges of sea-shells somewhat analogous to the limestone of guinness and the calcareous pelagic sediment called at guadeloupe platine or macon bon dieu in the chaos of the island of cuba or jardinios de rey e de reina the whole coral rock lying above the surface of the water appeared to me to be fragmentary that is composed of broken blocks it is however probable that in the depth it reposes on masses of polypi still living End of note. messieurs chamiso and guaymar have recently thrown great light on the formation of the coral islands in the pacific at the foot of the castillo de Impunta, near the havana on the shelves of cavernous rocks covered with verdant seaweeds and living polypi we find enormous masses of madrepores and other lithophyte corals set in the texture of those shelves note the surface of these shelves blackened and excavated by the waters presents ramifications like the cauliflower as they are observed on the currents of lava it is the change of colour produced by the waters owing to the manganese which we recognise by some dendrites the sea entering into the clefts of the rocks and in a cavern at the foot of the castillo del moro compresses the air and makes it issue with a tremendous noise this noise explains the phenomenon of the bajos roncadores snoring bocabillos so well known to navigators who cross from jamaica to the mouth of rio san juan of nicaragua or to the island of san andres End of note. we are at first tempted to admit that the whole of this limestone rock which constitutes the principal portion of the island of cuba may be traced to an uninterrupted operation of nature to the action of productive organic forces an action which continues in our days in the bosom of the ocean but this apparent novelty of limestone formations soon vanishes when we quit the shore and recollect the series of coral rocks which contain the formations of different ages the musselcock the jura limestone and coarse limestone the same coral rocks as those of the castillo and la punta are found in the lofty inland mountains accompanied with petrifactions of bivalve shells very different from those now seen on the coasts of antilles without positively assigning a determinate place in the table of formations to the limestone of guinness which is that of castillo and la punta i have no doubt of the relative antiquity of that rock with respect to the calcareous agglomerate of the chaos situated south of batabano and east of the island of pinos the globe has undergone great revolutions between the periods when these two soils were formed the one containing the great caverns of matanzas the other daily augmenting by the agglutination of fragments of coral and quartzose sand on the south of the island of cuba 
the latter soil seems to repose sometimes on the jura limestone of guinus as in the jardinios and sometimes towards cape cruz immediately over primitive rocks in the lesser antilles the corals are covered with volcanic productions several of the chaos of the island of cuba contain fresh water and i found this water very good in the middle of the cao de piedras when we reflect on the extreme smallness of these islands we can scarcely believe that the fresh-water wells are filled with rain-water not evaporated do they prove a submarine communication between the limestone of the coast with a limestone serving as the basis of the lithophyte polypi and is the fresh water of cuba raised up by hydrostatic pressure across the coral rocks of chaos as it is in the bay of hagua where in the middle of the sea it forms springs frequented by the lamentants the secondary formations on the east of the havana are pierced in a singular manner by cyanitic and euphotide rocks united in groups the southern bottom of the bay as well as the northern part the hills of the moro and the cabana are of jura limestone but on the eastern bank of the two ensenadas de regla and guanabacoa the whole is transition soil going from north to south and first near marimalina we find cyanite consisting of a great quantity of hornblende partly decomposed a little quartz and a reddish white feldspar seldom crystallized this fine cyanite the strata of which incline to the northwest alternates twice with serpentine the layers of intercalated serpentine are three toises thick farther south toward regla and guanabacoa the cyanite disappears and the whole soil is covered with serpentine rising in hills from thirty to forty toises high and running from east to west this rock is much fendilated externally of a bluish grey covered with dendrites of manganese and internally of leek and asparagus green crossed by small veins of asbestos it contains no garnet or amphibole but metalloid diallage disseminated in the mass the serpentine is sometimes of an equilus sometimes of a conchoidal fracture this was the first time i had found metalloid diallage within the tropics several blocks of serpentine have magnetic poles others are of such a homogeneous texture and have such glossiness that at a distance they may be taken for pectine resinite it were to be wished that these fine masses were employed in the arts as they are in several parts of germany in approaching guanabacoa we find serpentine crossed by veins between twelve and fourteen inches thick and filled with fibrous quartz amethyst and fine mamelon and stalactiform chalcedonies it is possible that chrysoprase may also one day be found some copper pyrites appear among these veins accompanied it is said by silvery grey copper i found no traces of this grey copper it is probably the metalloid diallage that has given the cerro de guanabacoa the reputation of riches in gold and silver which it has enjoyed for ages in some places petroleum flows from rents in the serpentine Note does there exist in the bay of the havana any other source of petroleum than that of guanabacoa or must it be admitted that the beton liquido which in fifteen o eight was employed by sebastian de ocampo for the caulking of ships is dried up that spring however fixed the attention of ocampo on the port of the havana where he gave it the name of puerto de carinas it is said that abundant springs of petroleum were also found in the eastern part of the island manantialas de betun y chapapote between holquin and mayari and on the coast of santiago de cuba End of note. springs of water are frequent they contain a little sulphuretted hydrogen and deposit oxide of iron the baths of barreto are agreeable but of nearly the same temperature as the atmosphere the geologic constitution of this group of serpentine rocks from its insulated position its veins its connection with cyanite and the facts of its rising up across shell formations merits particular attention feldspar with a basis of suda compact feldspar forms with diallage the euphotide and serpentine with pyroxene dolerite and basalt and with garnet eclogite these five rocks dispersed over the whole globe charged with oxidulated and titanious iron are probably of similar origin it is easy to distinguish two formations in the euphotide one is destitute of amphibole even when it alternates with amphibolic rocks joria in piedmont regla in the island of cuba rich in serpentine in metalloid diallage and sometimes in jasper tuscany saxony the other strongly charged with amphibole often passing to diorite 
has no jasper in layers and sometimes contains rich veins of copper silesia moussinet in piedmont the pyrenees parapara in venezuela copper mountains of north america Note. on a serpentine that flows like penumbra veins of greenstone diorite near lake cluny in perthshire see mcculloch in edinburgh journal of science eighteen twenty four july pages three to sixteen on a vein of serpentine and the alterations it produces on the banks of carity near west belloc in forfarshire see charles lyle l c volume three page forty three end of note it is the latter formation of euphotide which by its mixture with diorite is itself linked with hyperthenite in which real beds of serpentine are sometimes developed in scotland and in norway no volcanic rocks of a more recent period have hitherto been discovered in the island of cuba for instance neither trachytes dolerites nor basalts i know not whether they are found in the rest of the great antilles of which the geologic constitution differs essentially from that of the series of calcareous and volcanic islands which stretch from trinidad to the virgin islands earthquakes which in general are less fatal at cuba than at puerto rico and haiti are most felt in the eastern part between cape Maisy, santiago de cuba and la Quad de puerto principe perhaps towards those regions the action of the crevice extends laterally which is believed to cross the neck of granitic land between port au prince and cape tiburon and on which whole mountains were overthrown in seventeen seventy the cavernous texture of the limestone formations soboruco just described the great inclination of the shelvings the smallness of the island the nakedness of the plains and the proximity of the mountains that form a lofty chain on the southern coast may be considered as among the principal causes of the want of rivers and the drought which is felt especially in the western part of cuba in this respect haiti jamaica and several of the lesser antilles which contain volcanic heights covered with forests are more favored by nature the lands most celebrated for their fertility are the districts of Hagua, trinidad matanzas and mariel the valley of guinness owes its reputation to artificial irrigation sanyas de riego notwithstanding the want of great rivers and the unequal fertility of the soil the island of cuba by its undulated surface its continually renewed verdure and the distribution of its vegetable forms presents at every step the most varied and beautiful landscape two trees with large tough and glossy leaves the mamia and the calophyllum calaba five species of palm trees the palma real or oreodoxa regia the common cocoa tree the cocos crispa the corypha miraguama and the sea maritima and small shrubs constantly loaded with flowers decorate the hills and the savannas the cecropia peltata marks the humid spots it would seem as if the whole island had been originally a forest of palm lemon and wild orange trees the latter which bear a small fruit are probably anterior to the arrival of europeans who transported thither the agrumi of the gardens they rarely exceeded the height from ten to fifteen feet Note, the best informed inhabitants of the island assert that the cultivated orange trees brought from asia preserve the size and all the properties of their fruits when they become wild the brazilians affirm that the small bitter orange which bears the name of loranja do terra and is found wild far from the habitations of man is of american origin called clue travels in south america End of note. the lemon and orange trees are most frequently separate and the new planters in clearing the ground by fire distinguish the quality of the soil according as it is covered with one or other of those groups of social plants they prefer the soil of the naranjal to that which produces a small lemon in a country where the making of sugar is not sufficiently improved to admit of the employment of any other fuel than the bagasse dried sugar-cane the progressive destruction of the small woods is a positive calamity the aridity of the soil augments in proportion as it is stripped of the trees that sheltered it from the heat of the sun for the leaves emitting heat under a sky always serene occasion as the air cools a precipitation of aqueous vapours end of chapter three point twenty nine part two chapter three point twenty nine part three of personal narrative of travels to the equinoctial regions of america during the years seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o four 
volume three by alexander von humboldt translated by thomasina ross this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three point twenty nine part three among the few rivers worthy of attention the rio guineus may be noticed the rio armandaris or chorero of which the waters are led to the havana by the sanya de antonelli the rio canto on the north of the town of bayamo the rio maximo which rises on the east of puerto principe the rio sagua grande near via clara the rio de las palmas which issues opposite cayo galeado the small rivers jaruco and santa cruz between guanabo and matanzas navigable at the distance of some miles from their mouths and favourable for the shipment of sugar casks the rio san antonio which like many others is engulfed in the caverns of limestone rocks the rio guaurabo west of the port of trinidad and the rio galafre in the fertile districts of Filipinas, which throws itself into the laguna de cortez the most abundant springs rise on the southern coast where from Hagua to Punta de Sabina, over a length of forty-six leagues, the soil is extremely marshy. So great is the abundance of the waters, which filter by the clefts of the stratified rock that, from the effect of an hydrostatic pressure, fresh water springs far from the coast, and amidst salt water. The jurisdiction of the Havana is not the most fertile part of the island, and the few sugar plantations that existed in the vicinity of the capital are now converted into farms for cattle, potreros and fields of maize and forage of which the profits are considerable the agriculturists of the island of cuba distinguish two kinds of earth often mixed together like the squares of a draught board black earth negra o prieta clayey and full of moisture and red earth bermeja more silicious and containing oxide of iron the tierra negra is generally preferred on account of its best preserving humidity for the cultivation of the sugar-cane and the tierra bermeja for coffee but many sugar plantations are established on the red soil the climate of the havana is in accordance with the extreme limits of the torrid zone it is a tropical climate in which a more unequal distribution of heat at different parts of the year denotes the passage to the climates of the temperate zone calcutta latitude twenty two degrees thirty four minutes north canton latitude twenty three degrees eight minutes north macao latitude twenty two degrees twelve minutes north the havana latitude twenty three degrees nine minutes north and rio de janeiro latitude twenty two degrees fifty four minutes south are places which from their position at the level of the ocean near the tropics of cancer and capricorn consequently at an equal distance from the equator afford great facilities for the study of meteorology this study can only advance by the determination of certain numerical elements which are the indispensable basis of the laws we seek to discover the aspect of vegetation being identical near the limits of the torrid zone and at the equator we are accustomed to confound vaguely the climates of two zones comprised between zero and ten degrees and between fifteen and twenty three degrees of latitude the region of palm trees bananas and arborescent gramina extends far beyond the two tropics but it would be dangerous to apply what has been observed at the extremity of the tropical zone to what may take place in the plains near the equator in order to rectify those errors it is important that the mean temperature of the year and the months be well known as also the thermometric oscillations in different seasons at the parallel of the havana and to prove by an exact comparison with other points alike distant from the equator for instance with rio de janeiro and macao that the lowering of temperature observed in the island of cuba is owing to the eruption and stream of layers of cold air borne from the temperate zones toward the tropics of cancer and capricorn the mean temperature of the havana according to four years of good observations is twenty five point seven degrees twenty point six degrees r only two degrees centigrade above that of the regions of america nearest the equator the proximity of the sea raises the mean temperature of the year on the coast but in the interior of the island when the north winds penetrate with the same force and where the soil rises to a height of forty toises the mean temperature attains only twenty three degrees eighteen point four degrees r and does not exceed that of cairo and lower egypt the difference between the mean temperature of the hottest and coldest months rises to twelve degrees in the interior of the island at the havana and on the coast to eight degrees 
at Cumana to scarcely three degrees. The hottest months, July and August, attain 28.8 degrees at the island of Cuba, perhaps 29.5 degrees of mean temperature as at the equator. The coldest months are December and January. Their mean temperature in the interior of the island is 17 degrees, at the Havana 21 degrees, that is, 5 to 8 degrees below the same months at the equator, yet still 3 degrees above the hottest month at Paris. It will be interesting to compare the climate of the Havana with that of Macau and Rio de Janeiro, two places, one of which is near the limit of the northern torrid zone on the eastern coast of Asia, and the other on the eastern coast of America, toward the extremity of the southern torrid zone. The climate of the Havana, notwithstanding the frequency of the north and northwest winds, is hotter than that of Macau and Rio de Janeiro. The former partakes of the cold which, owing to the frequency of the west winds, is felt in winter along all the eastern coast of a great continent. The proximity of spaces of land covered with mountains and tablelands renders the distribution of heat in different months of the year more unequal at Macau and Canton than in an island bounded on the west and north by the hot waters of the Gulf Stream. The winters are therefore much colder at Canton and Macau than at the Havana, yet the latitude of Macau is one degree more southerly than that of the Havana, and the latter town and Canton are, within nearly a minute, on the same parallel. The thermometer at Canton has sometimes almost reached the point zero, and by the effect of reflection ice has been found on the terraces of houses. Although this great cold never lasts more than one day, the English merchants residing at Canton like to make chimney fires in their apartments from November to January, while at the Havana the artificial warmth even of a brasero is not required. Hail is frequent and the hailstones are extremely large in the Asiatic climate of Canton and Macau, while it is scarcely seen once in fifteen years at the Havana. In these three places, the thermometer sometimes keeps up for several hours between zero and four degrees centigrade, and yet, a circumstance which appears to be very remarkable, snow has never been seen to fall, and notwithstanding the great lowering of the temperature, the bananas and the palm trees are as beautiful around Canton macau and the havana as in the plains nearest the equator in the island of cuba the lowering of the temperature lasts only during intervals of such short duration that in general neither the banana the sugar-cane nor other productions of the torrid zone suffer much we know how well plants of vigorous organization resist temporary cold and that the orange trees of genoa survive the fall of snow and endure cold which does not more than exceed six or seven degrees below freezing point as the vegetation of the island of Cuba bears the character of the vegetation of the regions near the equator, we are surprised to find, even in the plains, a vegetable form of the temperate climates and mountains of the equatorial part of Mexico. I have often directed the attention of botanists to this extraordinary phenomenon in the geography of plants. The pine, Pinus occidentalis, is not found in the Lesser Antilles, not even in Jamaica, between seventeen and three quarters and eighteen and a half degrees of latitude it is only seen farther north in the mountains of san domingo and in all that part of the island of cuba situated between twenty and twenty-three degrees of latitude it attains a height of from sixty to seventy feet and it is remarkable that the cahoba mahogany suetinia mahogany lin and the pine vegetate at the island of pinos in the same plains we also find pines in the southeastern part of the island of Cuba, on the declivity of the Copper Mountains, where the soil is barren and sandy. The interior tableland of Mexico is covered with the same species of coniferous plants, at least the specimens brought by M. Bonplan and myself from Acaguisotla, Nevado de Toluca, and Confre de Perote do not appear to differ specifically from the Pinus occidentalis of the West India Islands described by Schwartz. Now, those pines which we see at sea level in the island of Cuba, in twenty and twenty-two degrees of latitude, and which belong only to the southern part of that island, do not descend on the Mexican continent between the parallels of seventeen and a half and nineteen and a half degrees, below the elevation of five hundred toises. I even observed that, on the road from Parote to Jalapa, in the eastern mountains, opposite to the island of Cuba, the limit of the pines is 935 toises, 
while in the western mountains between chilpanzingo and acapulco near quasiniquilipa two degrees further south it is five hundred and eighty toises and perhaps on some points four hundred and fifty these anomalies of stations are very rare in the torrid zone and are probably less connected with the temperature than with the nature of the soil in the system of the migration of plants we must suppose that the pinus occidentalis of cuba came from yucatan before the opening of the channel between cape catoche and cape san antonio and not from the united states so rich in coniferous plants for in florida the species of which we have here traced the botanical geography has not been discovered about the end of april m bonpland and myself having completed the observations we proposed to make at the northern extremity of the torrid zone were on the point of proceeding to vera cruz with a squadron of admiral ariz tizabal but being misled by false intelligence respecting the expedition of captain baudin we were induced to relinquish the project of passing through mexico on our way to the philippine islands the public journals announced that two french sloops the geographe and naturaliste had sailed for cape horn that they were to proceed along the coast of chile and peru and thence to new holland this intelligence revived in my mind all the projects i had formed during my stay in paris when i solicited the directory to hasten the departure of captain baudin on leaving spain i had promised to rejoin the expedition wherever i could reach it m bonpland and i resolved instantly to divide our herbals into three portions to avoid exposing to the risks of a long voyage the objects we had obtained with so much difficulty on the banks of the orinoco the atabapo and the rio negro we sent one collection by way of england to germany another by way of cadiz to france and a third remained at the havana we had reason to congratulate ourselves on this foresight each collection contained nearly the same species and no precautions were neglected to have the cases if taken by english or french vessels remitted to sir joseph banks or to the professors of natural history at the museum at paris it happened fortunately that the manuscripts which i at first intended to send with the collection to cadiz were not entrusted to our much esteemed friend and fellow-traveller fray juan gonzalez of the order of the observance of st francis who had followed us to the havana with the view of returning to spain he left the island of cuba soon after us but the vessel in which he sailed foundered on the coast of africa and the cargo and crew were all lost by this event we lost some of the duplicates of our herbals and what was more important all the insects which m bonpland had with great difficulty collected during our voyage to the orinoco and the rio negro by a singular fatality we remained two years in the spanish colonies without receiving a single letter from europe and those which arrived in the three following years made no mention of what we had transmitted the reader may imagine my uneasiness for the fate of a journal which contained astronomical observations and barometrical measurements of which i had made not any copy after having visited new granada peru and mexico and just when i was preparing to leave the new continent i happened at a public library of philadelphia to cast my eyes on a scientific publication in which i found these words quote, arrival of m de humboldt's manuscripts at his brother's house in paris by way of spain End quote. i could scarcely suppress an exclamation of joy while m bonpland laboured day and night to divide and put our collections in order a thousand obstacles arose to impede our departure there was no vessel in the port of the havana that would convey us to porto Bello or cartagena the persons i consulted seemed to take pleasure in exaggerating the difficulties of the passage of the isthmus and the dangerous voyage from panama to guayaquil and from guayaquil to lima and valparaiso not being able to find a passage in any neutral vessel i freighted a catalonian sloop lying at batabano which was to be at my disposal to take me either to portobello or cartagena according as the gales of st martha might permit Note the gales of st martha blow with great violence at that season below latitude twelve degrees end of note the prosperous state of commerce at the havana and the multiplied connections of that city with the ports of the pacific would facilitate for me the means of procuring funds for several years general don gonzalo o'farrell resided at the time in my native country as minister of the court of spain i could exchange my revenues in prussia for a part of his at the island of cuba 
and the family of Don Ignacio O'Farrell y Herrera, brother of the general, concurred kindly in all that could favor my new projects. On the 6th of March, the vessel I had freighted was ready to receive us. The road to Batabano led us once more by Guinness to the plantation of Rio Blanco, the property of Count Haruko y Mopox. The road from Rio Blanco to Batabano runs across an uncultivated country, half covered with forests. In the open spots the indigo plant and the cotton tree grow wild. As the capsule of the gossipium opens at the season when the northern storms are most frequent, the down that envelops the seed is swept from one side to the other, and the gathering of the cotton, which is of a very fine quality, suffers greatly. Several of our friends, among whom was Senor de Mendoza, captain of the port of Valparaiso, and brothers to the celebrated astronomer who resided so long in London, accompanied us to Potrero de Mopox. In herborizing further southward, we found a new palm tree with fan leaves, Corypha maritima, having a free thread between the interstices of the folioles. This Corypha covers a part of the southern coast and takes the place of the majestic palma real and the cocos crispa of the northern coast. Porous limestone of the Jura formation appeared from time to time in the plain. Batabano was then a poor village, and its church had been completed only a few years previously. The Cienega begins at the distance of half a league from the village. It is a tract of marshy soil, extending from the Laguna de Cortes as far as the mouth of the Rio Jagua, on a length of sixty leagues from west to east. At Batabano it is believed that in those regions the sea continues to gain upon the land, and that the oceanic eruption was particularly remarkable at the period of the great upheaving which took place at the end of the eighteenth century when the tobacco mills disappeared and the rio chorera changed its course nothing can be more gloomy than the aspect of these marshes around batabano not a shrub breaks the monotony of the prospect a few stunted trunks of palm trees rise like broken masts amidst great tufts of juncia and irides as we stayed only one night at batabano I regretted much that I was unable to obtain precise information relative to the two species of crocodiles which infest the Cienega. The inhabitants give to one of these animals the name of caiman, to the other that of crocodile, or, as they say commonly in Spain, cocodrilo. They assured us that the latter has most agility and measures most in height. His snout is more pointed than that of the caiman, and they are never found together. The crocodile is very courageous, and is said to climb into boats when he can find a support for his tail. He frequently wanders to the distance of a league from the Rio Cauto and the marshy coast of Jagua to devour the pigs on the islands. This animal is sometimes fifteen feet long, and will, it is said, pursue a man on horseback, like the wolves in Europe, while the animals exclusively called caimans at Batabano are so timid that people bathe without apprehension in places where they live in bands. These peculiarities, and the name of cocodrilo, given at the island of Cuba to the most dangerous of the carnivorous reptiles, appear to me to indicate a different species from the great animals of the Orinoco, Rio Magdalena, and St. Domingo. In other parts of the Spanish-American continent, the settlers, deceived by the exaggerated accounts of the ferocity of crocodiles in Egypt, allege that the real crocodile is only found in the Nile. Zoologists have, however, ascertained that there are in America caimans or alligators with obtuse snouts and legs not indented, and crocodiles with pointed snouts and indented legs, and in the old continent both crocodiles and gaviales. The Crocodilus acutus of San Domingo, in which I cannot hitherto specifically distinguish the crocodiles of the great rivers of the Orinoco and the Magdalena, has, according to Cuvier, so great a resemblance to the crocodile of the Nile that it required a minute examination to prove that the rule laid down by Buffon relative to the distribution of species between the tropical regions of the two continents was correct. Note. This striking analogy was ascertained by M. Geoffroy de saint hilaire in 1803, when General Rochambeau sent a crocodile from San Domingo to the Museum of Natural History at Paris. M. Bonpland and myself had made drawings and detailed descriptions, in 1801 and 1802, of the same species which inhabit the great rivers of South America, during our passage on the Apure, the Orinoco, and the Magdalena we committed the mistake so common to travellers 
of not sending them at once to Europe, together with some young specimens. End of note. On my second visit to the Havana, in 1804, I could not return to the Cienega of Batabano, and therefore I had the two species, called caimans and crocodiles, by the inhabitants, brought to me at great expense. Two crocodiles arrived alive. The oldest was four feet three inches long. They had been caught with great difficulty, and were conveyed, muzzled and bound, on a mule, for they were exceedingly vigorous and fierce. In order to observe their habits and movements, we placed them in a great hall, where, by climbing on a very high piece of furniture, we could see them attack great dogs. Note. M. de Courty, who knows the habits of the crocodile better than any other author, has written on that reptile, saw, like Dampier and myself, the crocodilus acutus often touch his tail with his mouth. End of note. Having seen much of crocodiles during six months, on the Orinoco, the Rio Apure, and the Magdalena, we were glad to have another opportunity of observing their habits before our return to Europe. The animals sent to us from Batabano had the snout nearly as sharp as the crocodiles of the Orinoco and the Magdalena, Crocodilus acutus huve. Their color was dark green on the back, and white below the belly, with yellow spots on the flanks. I counted, as in all the real crocodiles, thirty-eight teeth in the upper jaw and thirty in the lower. In the former, the tenth and ninth, and in the latter, the first and fourth, were the largest. In the description made by M. Bonpland and myself on the spot, we have expressly marked that the lower fourth tooth rises over the upper jaw. The posterior extremities were palmated. These crocodiles of Batabano appear to us to be specifically identical with the Crocodilus acutus. It is true that the accounts we heard of their habits did not quite agree with what we had ourselves observed on the Orinoco, but carnivorous reptiles of the same species are milder and more timid, or fiercer and more courageous, in the same river, according to the nature of the localities. The animal called the caiman at Batabano died on the way and was not brought to us, so that we could make no comparison of the two species. Note. The four bags filled with musk, bolzestil amzicla, are, in the crocodile of Batabano, exactly in the same position as in that of the Rio de Magdalena, beneath the lower jaw and near the anus. I was much surprised at not perceiving the smell of musk at the Havana, three days after the death of the animal, in a temperature of thirty degrees, while at Montpox on the banks of the Magdalena, living crocodiles infected our apartment. I have since found that Dampier also remarked an absence of smell in the crocodile of Cuba, where the caiman spreads a very strong smell of musk. End of note. I have no doubt that the crocodile with a sharp snout, and the alligator or caiman with a snout like a pike. Note. Crocodilus acutus of San Domingo, alligator Lucius of Florida and the Mississippi. End of note. Inhabit together, but in distinct bands, the marshy coast between Jagua, the Surguedero of Batabano, and the island of Pinos. In that island, Dampier was struck with the great difference between the caimans and the American crocodiles. After having described, though not always with perfect correctness, several of the characteristics which distinguish crocodiles from caimans, he traces the geographical distribution of those enormous saurians. Quote, In the Bay of Campeche, end quote, he says, quote, I saw only caimans or alligators. At the island of Great Cayman, there are crocodiles and no alligators. At the island of Pinos, and in the innumerable creeks of the coast of Cuba, there are both crocodiles and caimans. End quote. Note. Dampier's Voyages and Descriptions, 1599. End of note. To these valuable observations of Dampier, I may add that the real crocodile, Crocodilus acutus, is found in the West India Islands, nearest the mainland, for instance, at the island of Trinidad, at Margarita, and also probably at Curaçao, notwithstanding the want of fresh water. It is observed further south, in the Neveri, the Rio Magdalena, the Apure, and the Orinoco, as far as the confluence of the Casiquiare with the Rio Negro, latitude two degrees, two minutes, consequently more than four hundred leagues from Batabano. It would be interesting to verify on the eastern coast of Mexico and Guatemala, between the Mississippi and the Rio Chagres, in the Isthmus of Panama, the limit of the different species of carnivorous reptiles. End of chapter 3.29, part 3.
Chapter three point twenty nine, part four of Personal Narrative of Travels to the Equinoctial Regions of America during the years seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o four, volume three by Alexander von Humboldt, translated by Thomasina Ross. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three point twenty nine, part four. We set sail on the ninth of March, somewhat incommoded by the extreme smallness of our vessel which afforded us no sleeping place but upon the deck the cabin camara de pozo received no air or light but from above it was merely a hold for provisions and it was with difficulty that we could place our instruments in it the thermometer kept up constantly at thirty two and thirty three degrees centesimal luckily these inconveniences lasted only twenty days our several voyages in the canoes of the orinoco and a passage in an american vessel laden with several thousand arrobas of salt meat dried in the sun had rendered us not very fastidious the gulf of batabano bounded by a low and marshy coast looks like a vast desert the fishing birds which are generally at their post whilst the small land birds and the indolent vultures vulture aura are at roost are seen only in small numbers the sea is of a greenish brown hue as in some of the lakes of switzerland while the air owing to its extreme purity had at the moment the sun appeared above the horizon a cold tint of pale blue similar to that which landscape painters observe at the same hour in the south of italy and which makes distant objects stand out in strong relief our sleep was the only vessel in the gulf for the roadstead of batabano is scarcely visited except by smugglers or as they are here politely called the traders los tratantes the projected canal of guinness will render batabano an important point of communication between the island of cuba and the coast of venezuela the port is within a bay bounded by punta gorda on the east and by punta de salinas on the west but this bay is itself only the upper or concave end of a great gulf measuring nearly fourteen leagues from south to north and along an extent of fifty leagues between the laguna de cortes and the cao de piedras enclosed by an incalculable number of flats and chains of rocks one great island only of which the superficies is more than four times the dimensions of that of martinique with mountains crowned with majestic pines rises amidst this labyrinth this is the island of pinos called by columbus el evangelista and by some mariners of the sixteenth century the isla de santa maria it is celebrated for its mahogany switenia mahogany which is an important article of commerce. We sailed east-south-east, taking the passage of Don Cristobal to reach the rocky island of Cao de Piedras, and to clear the archipelago, which the Spanish pilots, in the early times of the conquest, designated by the names of gardens and bowers, Jardinas y Jardinillos. The Queen's Gardens, properly so called, are nearer Cape Cruz, and are separated from the archipelago by an open sea, thirty-five leagues broad columbus gave them the name they bear in fourteen ninety four when on his second voyage he struggled during fifty-eight days with the winds and currents between the island of pinos and the eastern cape of cuba he describes the islands of this archipelago as verdant full of trees and pleasant verdes llenos de arboleras y graciosos Note. there exists great geographical confusion even at the havana in reference to the ancient denominations of the Jardinas del Rey and the Jardinas de la Reina. In the description of the island of Cuba, given in the Mercurio Americano, and in the Historia Natural de la Isla de Cuba, published in the Havana by Don Antonio Lopez Gomez, the two groups are placed on the southern coast of the island. Lopez says that the Jardinas del Rey extend from the Laguna de Cortes to Bahia de Jagua, but it is historically certain that the governor diego velasquez gave his name to the western part of the chain of rocks of the old channel between cao francis and la monillo on the northern coast of the island of cuba the jardinas de la reina situated between cabo cruz and the port of the trinity are in no manner connected with the jardinas and jardinillos of the isla de pinos between the two groups of the chain of rocks are the flats placeres of la paz and jagua End of note. a part of these so styled gardens is indeed beautiful 
the voyager sees the scene change every moment and the verdure of some of the islands appears the more lovely from its contrast with chains of rocks displaying only white and barren sands the surface of these sands heated by the rays of the sun seems to be undulating like the surface of a liquid the contact of layers of air of unequal temperature produces the most varied phenomena of suspension and mirage from ten in the morning till four in the afternoon even in those desert places the sun animates the landscape and gives mobility to the sandy plain to the trunks of trees and to the rocks that project into the sea like promontories when the sun appears these inert masses seem suspended in air and on the neighbouring beach the sands present the appearance of a sheet of water gently agitated by the winds a train of clouds suffices to seat the trunks of trees and the suspended rocks again on the soil to render the undulating surface of the plains motionless and to dissipate the charm which the arabian persian and hindu poets have celebrated as quote, the sweet illusions of the solitary desert end quote. we doubled cape matahambra very slowly the chronometer of louis berthaud having kept time accurately at the havana i availed myself of this occasion to determine on this and the following days the positions of cao de don cristoval cao flamenco cao de diego perez and cao de piedras i also employed myself in examining the influence which the changes at the bottom of the sea produce on its temperature at the surface sheltered by so many islands the surface is calm as a lake of fresh water and the layers of different depths being distinct and separate the smallest change indicated by the lead acts on the thermometer i was surprised to see that on the east of the little cao de don cristoval the high banks are only distinguished by the milky colour of the water like the bank of vibora south of jamaica and many other banks the existence of which i ascertained by means of the thermometer the bottom of the rock of batabano is a sand composed of coral detritus it nourishes seaweeds which scarcely ever appear on the surface the water as i have already observed is greenish and the absence of the milky tint is no doubt owing to the perfect calm which pervades those regions whenever the agitation is propagated to a certain depth a very fine sand or a mass of calcareous particles suspended in the water renders it troubled and milky there are shallows however which are distinguished neither by the colour nor by the low temperature of the waters and i believe that phenomenon depends on the nature of a hard and rocky bottom destitute of sand and corals on the form and declivity of the shelvings the swiftness of the currents and the absence of the propagation of motion toward the lower layers of the water the cold frequently indicated by the thermometer at the surface of the high banks must be traced to the molecules of water which owing to the rays of heat and the nocturnal cooling fall from the surface to the bottom and are stopped in their fall by the high banks and also to the mingling of the layers of very deep water that rise on the shelvings of the banks as on an inclined plane to mix with the layers of the surface notwithstanding the small size of our bark and the boasted skill of our pilot we often ran aground the bottom being soft there was no danger but nevertheless at sunset near the pass of don cristoval we preferred to lie at anchor the first part of the night was beautifully serene we saw an incalculable number of falling stars all following one direction opposite to that from whence the wind blew in the low regions of the atmosphere the most absolute solitude prevails in this spot which in the time of columbus was inhabited and frequented by great numbers of fishermen the inhabitants of cuba then employed a small fish to take the great sea turtles they fastened a long cord to the tail of the revis the name given by the spaniards to that species of echinaeus note to the suquet or guayacan of the natives of cuba the spaniards have given the characteristic name of revis that is placed on its back or reversed in fact at first sight the position of the back and the abdomen is confounded aguirre says nostrares reversum appellant quia versus venatur i examined a remora of the south sea during the passage from lima to acapulco as he lived a long time out of the water i tried experiments on the weight he could carry before the blades of the disc loosened from the plank to which the animal was fixed but i lost that part of my journal it is doubtless the fear of danger that causes the remora not to lose his hold when he feels that he is being pulled by a cord or by the hand of man 
the sucet spoken of by columbus and martin d'aguirre was probably the echinea snocrates and not the echinea remora end of note the fisher fish formerly employed by the cubans by means of the flattened disc on its head furnished with suckers fixed himself on the shell of the sea turtle which is so common in the narrow and windy channels of the jardinios quote, the revis end quote, says christopher columbus quote, will sooner suffer himself to be cut in pieces than let go the body to which he adheres end quote. the indians drew to the shore by the same cord the fisher fish and the turtle when gomara and the learned secretary of the emperor charles v peter martyr d'anguera promulgated in europe this fact which they had learnt from the companions of columbus it was received as a traveller's tale there is indeed an air of the marvellous in the recital of d'anguera which begins in these words non alater ac nos cannabis gracilis per aquora campi lepurus insectamur in cole cuba insule venatorio pisca pisces alios capibant exactly as we follow hares with greyhounds in the fields so do the natives of cuba take fishes with other fish trained for that purpose we now know from the united testimony of rogers dampier and commerson that the artifice resorted to in the jardinios to catch turtles is employed by the inhabitants of the eastern coast of africa near cape natal at mozambique and at madagascar in egypt at san domingo and in the lakes of the valley of mexico the method practised for catching ducks was as follows men whose heads were covered with great calabashes pierced with holes hid themselves in the water and seized the birds by the feet the chinese from the remotest antiquity have employed the cormorant a bird of the pelican family for fishing on the coast rings are fixed round the bird's neck to prevent him from swallowing his prey and fishing for himself in the lowest degree of civilization the sagacity of man is displayed in the stratagems of hunting and fishing nations who probably never had any communication with each other furnish the most striking analogies in the means they employ in exercising their empire over animals three days elapsed before we could emerge from the labyrinth of jardinas and jardinios at night we lay at anchor and in the day we visited those islands or chains of rocks which were most easily accessible as we advanced eastward the sea became less calm and the position of the shoals was marked by water of a milky colour on the boundary of a sort of gulf between Cayo Flamenco and Cayo de Piedras, we found that the temperature of the sea at its surface augmented suddenly from 23.5 to 25.8 degrees centigrade. The geologic constitution of the rocky islets that rise around the island of Pinos fixed my attention the more earnestly as I had always rather doubted the existence of those huge masses of coral which are said to rise from the abyss of the Pacific to the surface of the water it appeared to me more probable that these enormous masses had some primitive or volcanic rock for a basis to which they adhered at small depths the formation partly compact and lithographic partly bulbous of the limestone of guinius had followed us as far as batabano it is somewhat analogous to the jura limestone and judging from their external aspect the cayman islands are composed of the same rock if the mountains of the island of pinos which present at the same time as it is said by the first historians of the conquest the pineta and palmetta be visible at the distance of twenty sea leagues they must attain a height of more than five hundred toises i have been assured that they also are formed of a limestone altogether similar to that of guinness from these facts i expected to find the same rock jura limestone in the jardinios but i saw in the chain of rocks that rises generally five to six inches above the surface of the water only a fragmentary rock in which angular pieces of madrepores are cemented by quartzo sand sometimes the fragments form a mass of from one to two cubic feet and the grains of quartz so disappear that in several layers one might imagine that the polypi have remained on the spot the total mass of this chain of rocks appears to me a limestone aggregate somewhat analogous to the earthy limestone of the peninsula of araya near cumana but of much more recent formation the inequalities of this coral rock are covered by a detritus of shells and madrepores. Whatever rises above the surface of the water is composed of broken pieces, cemented by carbonate of lime, in which grains of quartzose sand are set. 
whether rocks formed by polypi still living are found at great depth below this fragmentary rock of coral or whether these polypi are raised on the jura formation are questions which i am unable to answer pilots believe that the sea diminishes in these latitudes because they see the chain of rocks augment and rise either by the earth which the waves heave up or by successive agglutinations it is not impossible that the enlarging of the channel of bahama by which the waters of the gulf stream issue may cause in the lapse of ages a slight lowering of the waters south of cuba and especially in the gulf of mexico the centre of the great current which runs along the shores of the united states and casts the fruits of tropical plants on the coast of norway Note, quote, the gulf stream between the bahamas and florida is very little wider than bering strait and yet the water rushing through this passage is of sufficient force and quantity to put the whole northern atlantic in motion and to make its influence be felt in the distant strait of gibraltar and on the more distant coast of africa End quote. quarterly review february eighteen eighteen End of note. the configuration of the coast the direction the force and the duration of certain winds and currents the changes which the barometric heights undergo through the variable predominance of those winds are causes the concurrence of which may alter in a long space of time and in circumscribed limits of extent and height the equilibrium of the seas i do not pretend to explain by the same causes the great phenomena of the coast of sweden where the sea has on some points the appearance of a very unequal lowering of from three to five feet in one hundred years the great geologist leopold von buch has imparted new interest to these observations by examining whether it be not rather some parts of the continent of scandinavia which insensibly heaves up an analogous supposition was entertained by the inhabitants of dutch guiana End of note. when the coast is so low that the level of the soil at a league within the island does not change to the extent of a few inches these swellings and diminution of the waters strike the imagination of the inhabitants the cayo bonito pretty rock which we first visited fully merits its name from the richness of its vegetation everything denotes that it has been long above the surface of the ocean and the central part of the cayo is not more depressed than the banks on a layer of sand and land shells five to six inches thick covered by a fragmentary madreporic rock rises a forest of mangroves rhizophora from their form and foliage they might at a distance be mistaken for laurel trees the avicennia the batis some small euphorbia and grasses by the intertwining of their roots fix the moving sands but the characteristic distinction of the flora of these coral islands is the magnificent tornifortia nafolioides of jacquin with silvered leaves which we found here for the first time this is a social plant and is a shrub from four feet and a half to five feet high its flowers emit an agreeable perfume and it is the ornament of cao flamenco cao piedras and perhaps of the greater part of the lowlands of the jardinios while we were employed in herborizing our sailors were searching among the rocks for lobsters note we gathered sancris myosuroides euphorbia buxifolia batis maritima erisini obtusifolia tornifortia nafolioides diomedea glabrata calcicubensis dolicos miniatus parthenium hystrophorus etc the last named plant which we had previously found in the valley of caracas and on the temperate tablelands of mexico between four hundred and seventy and nine hundred toises high covers the fields of the island of cuba it is used by the inhabitants for aromatic baths and to drive away the fleas which are so numerous in tropical climates at cumana the leaves of several species of cassia are employed on account of their smell against those annoying insects End of note. disappointed at not finding them they avenge themselves by climbing on the mangroves and making a dreadful slaughter of the young alcatras grouped in pairs in their nests this name is given in spanish america to the brown swan-tailed pelican of buffon with the want of foresight peculiar to the great pelagic birds the alcatra builds his nest where several branches of trees unite together we counted four or five nests on the same trunk of a mangrove the young birds defend themselves valiantly with their enormous beaks which are six or seven inches long the old ones hovered over our heads making hoarse and plaintive cries blood streamed from the tops of the trees 
for the sailors were armed with great sticks and cutlasses, machetes. In vain we reproved them for this cruelty. Condemned to long obedience in the solitude of the seas, this class of men feel pleasure in exercising a cruel tyranny over animals when occasion offers. The ground was covered with wounded birds struggling in death. At our arrival a profound calm prevailed in this secluded spot. Now everything seemed to say, man has passed this way. The sky was veiled with reddish vapors, which, however, dispersed in the direction of the southwest. We hoped but in vain to discern the heights of the island of Pinos. Those spots have a charm in which most parts of the New World are wanting. They are associated with recollections of the greatest names of the Spanish monarchy, those of Christopher Columbus and of Hernán Cortés. It was on the southern coast of the island of Cuba, between the Bay of Jagua and the island of Pinos, that the great Spanish admiral, in his second voyage, saw with astonishment, quote, that mysterious king who spoke to his subjects only by signs, and that group of men who wore long white tunics, like the monks of La Merced, whilst the rest of the people were naked, end quote. Quote, Columbus, in his fourth voyage, found in the Jardinios great boats filled with Mexican Indians, and laden with the rich productions and merchandise of Yucatan, end quote. Misled by his ardent imagination, he thought he had heard from those navigators, quote, that they came from a country where the men were mounted on horses, and wore crowns of gold on their heads, end quote. Note. Compare the Letra Rarissima di Cristoforo Colombo di 7 Julio, 1503, with a letter of Herrera, dated December 1. Nothing can be more touching and pathetic than the expression of melancholy which prevails in the letter of Columbus, written at Jamaica, and addressed to King Fernand and Queen Isabella. I recommend to the notice of those who wish to understand the character of that extraordinary man the recital of the nocturnal vision in which he imagined that he heard a celestial voice in the midst of a tempest, encouraging him by these words, E Dio maravagliosamente fece sonar tua nome nella terra, le indi che sone parte del mondo così ricca, te la ha date per tue, tu la hai repartit dove ti è piaciuto, e ti dette potenzia per farlo, degli ligamenti della mare oceano che erano serate, con catene così forte, ti doni la chiave, etc. God marvelously makes thy name resound throughout the world. The Indies, which are so rich a portion of the world, he gives to thee for thyself. Thou mayest distribute them in the way thou pleasest, and God gives thee power to do so. Of the shores of the Atlantic, which were closed by such strong chains, he gives thee the key. This fragment has been handed down to us only in an ancient Italian tradition, for the Spanish original mentioned in the Bibliotheca Nautica of Don Antonio Leon has been hitherto not found. I may add a few more lines characterized by great simplicity, written by the discoverer of the new world. Quote, Your Highness, end quote, says Columbus, quote, may believe me, the globe of the earth is far from being so great as the vulgar admit. I was seven years at your royal court, and during seven years was told that my enterprise was a folly. Now that I have opened the way, tailors and shoemakers ask the privilege of going to discover new lands. Persecuted, forgotten as I am. I never think of Hispaniola and Paria without my eyes being filled with tears. I was twenty years in the service of your highness. I have not a hair that is not white, and my body is enfeebled. Heaven and earth now mourn for me. All who have pity, truth, and justice mourn for me. Piagna adesso il cielo e piagna per me la terra, piagna per me ci ha carita, verita, giustizia. End quote. Letra rarissima, pages 13, 19, 34, 37. End of note. Quote, Kataio, China, the emperor of the great Khan, and the mouth of the Ganges, end quote, appeared to him so near that he hoped soon to employ two Arabian interpreters, whom he had embarked at Cadiz in going to America. Other remembrances of the island of Pinos and the surrounding gardens are connected with the conquest of Mexico. When Hernán Cortés was preparing his great expedition, he was wrecked with his nave capitana on one of the flats of the Jardinios. For the space of five days he was believed to be lost, and the valiant Pedro de Alvarado sent, in November 1518, 
from the port of Carinas, the Havana, three vessels in search of him. Note. At that period there were two settlements, one at Puerto de Carinas, in the ancient Indian province of the Havana, and the other, the most considerable, in the Via de San Cristóbal de Cuba. These settlements were only united in 1519, when the Puerto de Carinas took the name of San Cristóbal de la Habana. Quote, Cortés, end quote, says Herrera, quote, Paso a la Via de San Cristóbal, que a la sazón estaba en las costas de sur, y después se pasó a la Habana, end quote. Cortés proceeded to the town of San Cristóbal, which at the time was on the sea coast, and afterwards he repaired to the Havana. End of note. In February 1519, Cortés assembled his whole fleet near Cape San Antonio, probably on the spot which still bears the name of Ensenada de Cortés, west of Batabano, and opposite to the island of Pinos. From thence, believing he should better escape the snares laid for him by the governor Velasquez, he passed, almost clandestinely, to the coast of Mexico. Strange vicissitude of events. The empire of Montezuma was shaken by a handful of men who, from the western extremity of the island of Cuba, landed on the coast of Yucatan, and in our days, three centuries later, Yucatan, now a part of the new confederation of the free states of Mexico, has nearly menaced with conquest the western coast of Cuba. End of chapter 3.29, part 4. Chapter 3.29, part 5 of Personal Narrative of Travels to the Equinoctial Regions of America during the years 1799 to 1804, volume 3, by Alexander von Humboldt. Translated by Thomasina Ross. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3.29, part 5. On the morning of the 11th of March, we visited Cayo Flamenco. I found the latitude 21 degrees, 59 minutes, 39 seconds. The center of this island is depressed, and only 14 inches above the surface of the sea. The water here is brackish, while in other chaos it is quite fresh. The mariners of Cuba attribute this freshness of the water to the action of the sands in filtering seawater, the same cause which is assigned for the freshness of the lagunas of Venice but this supposition is not justified by any chemical analogy. The chaos are composed of rocks, and not of sands, and their smallness renders it extremely improbable that the pluvial waters should unite in a permanent lake. Perhaps the fresh water of this chain of rocks comes from the neighboring coast, from the mountains of Cuba, by the effect of hydrostatic pressure. This would prove a prolongation of the strata of Jura limestone below the sea, and a superposition of coral rock on that limestone. Note. Eruptions of fresh water in the sea near Baye, Syracuse, and Aridus in Phoenicia were known to the ancients. Strabo, Lib. 16, page 754. The coral islands that sound Radak, especially the low island of Otdia, furnish also fresh water. Chamiso and Kotzebues and de Kungsreisa, volume 3, page 108. End of note. It is too general a prejudice to consider every source of fresh or salt water to be merely a local phenomenon. Currents of water circulate in the interior of lands between strata of rocks of a particular density or nature at immense distances, like the floods that furrow the surface of the globe. The learned engineer Don Francisco Le Mar informed me that the Bay of Jagua, half a degree east of the Jardinios, there issue in the middle of the sea springs of fresh water two leagues and a half from the coast. These springs gush up with such force that they cause an agitation of the water, often dangerous for small canoes. Vessels that are not going to Hagua sometimes take in water from these ocean springs, and the water is fresher and colder in proportion to the depth whence it is drawn. The manatees, guided by instinct, have discovered this region of fresh waters, and the fishermen who like the flesh of these herbivorous animals find them in abundance in the open sea. Note. Possibly they subsist upon seaweed in the ocean, as we saw them feed on the banks of the Apure and the Orinoco, on several species of Panicum and Oplismentus, Camalote. It appears common enough on the coast of Tabasco and Honduras, at the mouths of rivers, to find the manatees swimming in the sea, as crocodiles do sometimes. 
Dampier distinguishes between the freshwater and the saltwater manatee. Voyage and Descri, Volume 2. Among the Cayos de las Doches Leguas, east of Jagua, some islands bear the name of Menajos de Manati. End of note. Half a mile east of Cayo Flamenco, we passed close to two rocks on which the waves break furiously. They are at the Piedras de Diego Perez, latitude 21 degrees 58 minutes 10 seconds. The temperature of the sea at its surface lowers at this point to 22.6 degrees centigrade, the depth of the water being only about one fathom. In the evening we went on shore at Cayo de Piedras, two rocks connected together by breakers and lying in the direction of north-northwest to south-southeast. On these rocks, which form the eastern extremity of the Jardinillos, many vessels are lost, and they are almost destitute of shrubs because shipwrecked crews cut them to make fire signals. The Cayo de Piedras is extremely precipitous on the side near the sea, and toward the middle there is a small basin of fresh water. We found a block of madrepore in the rock, measuring upwards of three cubic feet. Doubtless, this limestone formation, which at a distance resembles Jura limestone, is a fragmentary rock. It would be well if this chain of chaos which surrounds the island of Cuba were examined by geologists, with the view of determining what may be attributed to the animals which still work at the bottom of the sea, and what belongs to the real tertiary formations, the age of which may be traced back to the date of the coarse limestone abounding in remains of lithophyte coral. In general, that which rises above the waters is only breccia, or aggregate of madreporic fragments, cemented by carbonate of lime, broken shells, and sand. It is important to examine in each of the chaos on what this breccia reposes, whether it covers edifices of mollusca still living, or those secondary and tertiary rocks, which, judging from the remains of coral they contain, seem to be the product of our days. The gypsum of the chaos opposite San Juan de los Remedios, on the northern coast of the island of Cuba, merits great attention. Its age is doubtless more remote than historic times, and no geologist will believe that it is the work of the mollusca of our seas. From the Cayo de Piedras we could faintly discern in the direction of east-north-east the lofty mountains that rise beyond the Bay of Jagua. During the night we again lay at anchor, and the next day, 12th March, having passed between the northern cape of the Cayo de Piedras and the island of Cuba, we entered a sea free from breakers. Its blue color, a dark indigo tint, and the heightening of the temperature proved how much the depth of the water had augmented. We tried, under favor of the variable winds on sea and shore, to steer eastward as far as the port of La Trinidad, so that we might be less opposed by the northeast winds, which then prevail in the open sea, in making the passage to Cartagena, of which the meridian falls between Santiago de Cuba and the Bay of Guantanamo. Having passed the marshy coast of Camareos, note, here the celebrated philanthropist Bartolomeo de las Casas, obtained in 1514 from his friend Velasquez the governor, a good repartiamente de Indios, grant of land so called. This he renounced in the same year from scruples of conscience, during a short stay at Jamaica. End of note. We arrived, latitude 21 degrees 50 minutes, in the meridian of the entrance of the Bahia de Jagua. The longitude the chronometer gave me at this point was almost identical with that since published, in 1821, in the map of the Deposito Hidrográfico of Madrid. The port of Jagua is one of the finest but least frequented of the island. Quote, there cannot be another such in the world, end quote, is the remark of the coronista major, Antonio de Herrera. The surveys and plans of defence made by M. Le Mort at the time of the commission of Count Haruco prove that the anchorage of Jagua merits the celebrity it acquired even in the first years of the conquest. The town consists merely of a small group of houses and a fort, Castellito. On the east of Jagua, the mountains, Cerros de San Juan, near the coast assume an aspect more and more majestic, not from their height, which does not seem to exceed three hundred toises, but from their steepness and general form. The coast, I was told, is so steep that a frigate may approach the mouth of the Rio Guaurabo. When the temperature of the air diminished at night to twenty-three degrees, and the wind blew from the land, it brought that delicious odor of flowers and honey which characterizes the shores of the island of Cuba. Note. 
Cuban wax, which is a very important object of trade, is produced by the bees of Europe, the species Apis, Latra. Columbus says expressly that in his time the inhabitants of Cuba did not collect wax. The great loaf of that substance which he found in the island in his first voyage, and presented to King Ferdinand in the celebrated audience of Barcelona, was afterwards ascertained to have been brought thither by Mexican barks from Yucatan. It is curious that the wax of Melipones was the first production of Mexico that fell into the hands of the Spaniards in the month of November, 1492. End of note. We sailed along the coast, keeping two or three miles distant from the land. On the 13th March, a little before sunset, we were opposite the mouth of Rio San Juan, so much dreaded by navigators, on account of the innumerable quantity of mosquitoes and zancudos which fill the atmosphere. It is like the opening of a ravine, in which vessels of heavy burden might enter, but that a shoal, placer, obstructs the passage. Some horary angles gave me the longitude, 82 degrees 40 minutes 50 seconds, for this port, which is frequented by the smugglers of Jamaica and the corsairs of Providence Island. The mountains that command the port scarcely rise to 230 toises. I passed a great part of the night on deck. The coast was dreary and desolate. Not a light announced a fisherman's hut. There is no village between Batabano and Trinidad, a distance of fifty leagues. Scarcely are there more than two or three corrals, or farmyards, containing hawks or cows. Yet, in the time of Columbus, this territory was inhabited along the shore. When the ground is dug to make wells, or when torrents furrow the surface of the earth in floods, stone hatchets and copper utensils are often discovered. These are the remains of the ancient inhabitants of America. Note. Doubtless, the copper of Cuba. The abundance of this metal in its native state would naturally induce the Indians of Cuba and Haiti to melt it. Columbus says that there are masses of native copper at Haiti, of the weight of six arrobas, and that the boats of Yucatan, which he met with on the eastern coast of Cuba, carried, among other Mexican merchandise, crucibles to melt copper. End of note. At sunrise I requested the captain to heave the lead. There was no bottom to be found at sixty fathoms, and the ocean was warmer at its surface than anywhere else. It was at 26.8 degrees. The temperature exceeded 4.2 degrees, that which we had found near the breakers of Diego Perez. At the distance of half a mile from the coast, the sea water was not more than 22.5 degrees. We had no opportunity of sounding, but the depth of the water had no doubt diminished. On the 14th of March, we entered the Rio Guaurabo, one of the two ports of Trinidad de Cuba, to put on shore the Practico, or pilot of Batabano, who had steered us across the flats of the Jardinillos, though not without causing us to run aground several times. We also hoped to find a packet boat, Correo Maritimo, in this port, which would take us to Cartagena. I landed towards the evening and placed Borras Azimuth Compass and the artificial horizon on the shore for the purpose of observing the passage of some stars by the meridian. But we had scarcely begun our preparations when a party of small traders of the class called Pulperos, who had dined on board a foreign ship recently arrived, invited us to accompany them to the town. These good people requested us mount two by two on the same horse, and as the heat was excessive we accepted their offer. The distance from the mouth of the Rio Guaurabo to Trinidad is nearly four miles in a northwest direction. The road runs across a plain, which seems as if it had been leveled by a long sojourn of the waters. It is covered with vegetation, to which the maraguam, a palm tree with silvered leaves, which we saw here for the first time, gives a peculiar character. Note. Carifa miraguama, probably the same species which struck Messrs. John and William Fraser, father and son in the vicinity of Matanzas. These two botanists, who introduced a great number of valuable plants to the gardens of Europe, were shipwrecked on their voyage to Havana from the United States, and saved themselves with difficulty on the chaos at the entrance of the Old Channel, a few weeks before my departure for Cartagena. End of note. This fertile soil, although of Tierra Colorada, requires only to be tilled, and it would yield fruitful harvests. A very picturesque view opens westward on the Lomas of San Juan, a chain of calcareous mountains from 1,800 to 2,000 toises high, and very steep toward the south. 
their bare and barren summits form sometimes round blocks and here and there rise up in points like horns a little inclined note wherever the rock is visible i perceived compact limestone whitish grey partly porous and partly with a smooth fracture as in the jura formation End of note. notwithstanding the great lowering of the temperature during the season of the nortes or north winds snow never falls and only a hoar-frost escarcha is seen on these mountains as on those of santiago this absence of snow is difficult to be explained in emerging from the forest we perceived a curtain of hills of which the southern slope is covered with houses this is the town of trinidad founded in fifteen fourteen by the governor diego velasquez on account of the rich mines of gold which were said to have been discovered in the valley of rio arimao note this river flows toward the east into the bahia de Hagua. End of note. the streets of trinidad all have a rapid descent there as in most parts of spanish america it is complained that the conquistadors chose very injudiciously the sites for new towns note it is questionable whether the town founded by velasquez was not situated in the plain and nearer the points of casilda and guaurabo it has been suggested that the fear of the french portuguese and english freebooters led to the selection even in inland places of sites on the declivity of mountains whence as from a watch-tower the approach of the enemy could be discerned but it seems to me that these fears could have had no existence prior to the government of hernando de soto the havana was sacked for the first time by french corsairs in fifteen thirty nine end of note at the northern extremity is the church of nuestra senora de la popa a celebrated place of pilgrimage this point i found to be seven hundred feet above the level of the sea it commands a magnificent view of the ocean the two ports puerto casilda and boca guaurabo a forest of palm trees and the group of the lofty mountains of san juan we were received at the town of trinidad with the kindest hospitality by senor munoz the superintendent of the real hacienda i made observations during a great part of the night and found the latitude near the cathedral by the spica virginis alpha of the centaur and beta of the southern cross under circumstances not equally favourable to be twenty one degrees forty eight minutes forty seconds my chronometric longitude was eighty two degrees twenty one minutes seven seconds i was informed at my second visit to the havana in returning from mexico that this longitude was nearly identical with that obtained by the captain of a frigate don jose del rio who had long resided on that spot but that he marked the latitude of the town at twenty one degrees forty two minutes forty seconds the lieutenant governor teniente governadore of trinidad whose jurisdiction then extended to Villa Clara, Principe, and Santo Espiritu, was nephew to the celebrated astronomer Don Antonio Uloa. He gave us a great entertainment, at which we met some French immigrants from San Diego, who had brought their talents and industry to Spanish America. The exportation of the sugar of Trinidad, by the registers of the Custom House, did not exceed four thousand chests. The advantage of having two ports is often discussed at Trinidad, the distance of the town from the puerto de casilda and the puerto guaurabo is nearly equal yet the expense of transport is greatest in the former port the boca del rio guaurabo defended by a new battery furnishes safe anchorage although less sheltered than that of the puerto casilda vessels that draw little water or are lightened to pass the bar can go up the river and approach the town within a mile the packet boats Correos, that touch at trinidad de cuba prefer in general the rio guaurabo where they find safe anchorage without needing a pilot the puerto casilda is more enclosed and goes further back inland but cannot be entered without a pilot on account of the breakers arrecifes and the mulas and mulatas the great mole constructed with wood and very useful to commerce was damaged in discharging pieces of artillery it is entirely destroyed and it was undecided whether it would be best to reconstruct it with masonry according to the project of don luis de bassacourt or to open the bar of guaurabo by dredging it the great disadvantage of the puerto de gasilda is the want of fresh water which vessels have to procure at the distance of a league we passed a very agreeable evening in the house of one of the richest inhabitants don antonio padron where we found assembled at a tertulia all the good company of trinidad 
we were again struck with the gaiety and vivacity that distinguished the women of cuba these are happy gifts of nature to which the refinements of european civilization might lend additional charms but which nevertheless please in their primitive simplicity we quitted trinidad on the night of the fifteenth march the municipality caused us to be conducted to the mouth of the rio guaurabo in a fine carriage lined with old crimson damask and to add to our confusion an ecclesiastic the poet of the place habited in a suit of velvet notwithstanding the heat of the climate celebrated in a sonnet our voyage to the orinoco on the road leading to the port we were forcibly struck by a spectacle which our stay of two years in the hottest part of the tropics might have rendered familiar to us but previously i had nowhere seen such an innumerable quantity of phosphorescent insects note cocuyo a later noctilusus end of note the grass that overspread the ground the branches and the foliage of the trees all shone with that reddish and movable light which varies in its intensity at the will of the animal by which it is produced it seemed as though the starry firmament reposed on the savannah in the hut of the poorest inhabitants of the country fifteen cocuyos placed in a calabash pierced with holes afford sufficient light to search for anything during the night to shake the calabash forcibly is all that is necessary to excite the animal to increase the intensity of the luminous discs situated on each side of its body the people of the country remark with a simple truth of expression that calabashes filled with cocuyos are lanterns always ready lighted they are in fact only extinguished by the sickness or death of the insects which are easily fed with a little sugar-cane a young woman at trinidad de cuba told us that during a long and difficult passage from the mainland she always made use of the phosphorescence of the cocuyos when she gave suck to her child at night the captain of the ship would allow no other light on board from the fear of corsairs as the breeze freshened in the direction of northeast we sought to avoid the group of the caymans but the current drove us toward those islands sailing to south one quarter southeast we gradually lost sight of the palm-covered shore the hills rising above the town of trinidad and the lofty mountains of the island of cuba there is something solemn in the aspect of land from which the voyager is departing and which he sees sinking by degrees below the horizon of the sea the interest of this impression was heightened at the period to which i here avert when st domingo was the centre of great political agitations and threatened to involve the other islands in one of those sanguinary struggles which reveal to man the ferocity of his nature these threatened dangers were happily averted the storm was appeased on the spot which gave it birth and a free black population far from troubling the peace of the neighbouring islands has made some steps in the progress of civilization and has promoted the establishment of good institutions puerto rico cuba and jamaica with three hundred and seventy thousand whites and eight hundred and eighty five thousand men of colour surround haiti where a population of nine hundred thousand negroes and mulattoes have been emancipated by their own efforts the negroes more inclined to cultivate alimentary plants than colonial productions augment with a rapidity only surpassed by the increase of the population of the united states End of chapter three point twenty nine